So now is the time for the reading of the scripture. Uh, we'll be starting with Psalm 148. So if you have Bibles or your devices, pull those out. Psalm 148. We'll be reading from the New International Version, and Paul DeHart will be our reader this morning. But as is this the word of God, let's pray that God will guide us and open our hearts to his word. Um, I'm excited to deliver. I'm, I'm both excited and a little, um, I don't want to say nervous, but um, I'm going to ask a question. It's going to be kind of a tough question that we need to think about. And, uh, but I'm excited about what God will do with us and for us through his word. Let's pray. Almighty God, in you and you alone are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And so we ask that you would open our ears and open our eyes and open our hearts that we may see and hear and know the wonders of your promises and give us grace that we may grow in the faith, in our faith and trust in you so that we may walk in faithful obedience to your call through Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Okay, why don't you come over here and I'll work the screen. Yeah. So the reading this morning from the Old Testament, Psalm 148. Praise the Lord. Oops, sorry. The, re <laughs> the reading from Psalm 148. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights above. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his heavenly hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the skies. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for at his command they were created, and he established them forever and ever. He issued a decree that will never pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures and all ocean depths. Lightning and hail, snow and clouds, stormy winds that do his bidding. You mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild animals and cattle, small creatures and flying birds, kings of the earth and all nations, you princes and all rulers on earth, young men and women, and old men and children, let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His splendor is above the earth and the heavens, and he has raised up for his people a horn, the praise of all his faithful servants of Israel, the people close to his heart. Praise the Lord. And from the New Testament, the book of Colossians, chapter 1, verses 15 through 20. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. And our gospel reading this morning is from Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 8. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took spices that they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly, two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said, 
Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee? The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God, brother. So it's a funny thing about uh, these readings. I can't tell you how many times I hear somebody else reading these words and I go, ooh, that would make a good sermon. Oh, that would make a good sermon. Oh, that would make a good sermon. We're only going to preach one sermon today. <laughs> So Psalm 148, right? We're in the middle of a series uh, really focusing on the last five or six Psalms in the scroll of the Psalms. There are 150 Psalms in the Psalm scroll. And I've mentioned before that recent scholarship has, has uh, noticed that these Psalms seem to be arranged very intentionally to tell a story. Or maybe, maybe a more accurate way of putting it uh, is they are arranged to comment on or communicate the experience of the story from the viewpoint of those in the story. And I get a, a lot of these ideas from a, a scholar named Carissa Quinn, uh, who works with the Bible Project, and she's been very helpful to me in, in kind of understanding of it. Let me kind of just briefly kind of summarize what that looks like for you. The, the, you may or may not know that the scroll of the Psalms is actually divided into five books. If you leaf through the Psalms, you'll see book one, book two, book three, right? There's actually five books. And the story begins in the first book by really uh, talking about the hopes surrounding the promise of a coming king who will bring victory to Israel. The, The tone for that is really set by Psalm 2. And then it leads us through the experience of David's affliction and struggle, and then the joy and gratitude that David experiences as God rescues him from his trouble and raises him up as king. And then from there, we, we, we have a number of Psalms that, that uh, kind of describe the pain of Israel as it falls to enemy nations and the people are left without a king or a home because they've been carried off into exile. And that section ends like Psalm 88 and 89. And if you're familiar with those Psalms, those are quite possibly the darkest Psalms in the whole book. And then, and then, but then we see a turn in tone, if you will. And there's a growing awareness through the poems that they need a king greater than David, a home that can never be taken away. And the Psalms begin to explore how Israel renews their trust in Yahweh as their king and how God will bring about his kingdom through a future messianic king from the line of David. That's the flow of the story that you actually see you know, through, the, through the, uh, the, pro- the progression of the Psalms. And it seems like it was done on purpose. The Psalms are not just a big bucket where, oh, here's a poem, we'll just throw that in there. They were carefully arranged to kind of follow this flow. And if you think about what I just outlined, isn't that the story of the gospel? The Psalms flow the story of the gospel. They flow the narrative of the gospel. And if that's intentional, then we know that the fact that these last five poems forming the conclusion, the epilogue, if you will, to the entire story, that that was done on purpose too, right? So sometimes I know when not a lot of us read poetry so much anymore, but poetry is not like discourse. It's not like a lecture. There's going to be, they, they use poetic devices, imagery, right? And, and, and different kinds of word plays and things like that. And, and yes, especially here, we have this issue of repetition. But repetition is, a, is much more important as a poetic and literary device for the Hebrew language than it is for us. So rather than being frustrated by all this repetition, we need to ask, why is it here? What is God trying to say? What is he trying to drive home? through all this repetition. And I've come to think of these last five poems in the Psalm scroll as like a great gateway forming an exit from a magnificent temple. Imagine the, the, the Psalms being a temple where we come to spend time with God. And in the midst of this gateway, where we go out of the temple, there's a great bell that has been cast from solid bronze. And there's an inscription on the bell. And it says, while in this temple, 
The creator of all that is has revealed to you a glimpse of his goodness and his greatness. And so visitor, as you take your leave, ring this bell so that others may hear what you have seen. That's what I imagine this, this, these five poems at the end are like. And it's a call to us to ring the bell of God's goodness and God's greatness so that all can hear it. Now, Psalm 148 is right in the middle of this little concentrated um, pile of praise, if you will. Uh, and it has a distinctive structure. If the whole Psalms as a book has a distinctive structure, we can certainly see a distinctive structure in this particular Psalm. And what it does is if you consider the, the flow of, of the of the unrolling of the poem, it calls for us to praise God in two realms, or rather it calls for two realms of existence to praise God. First, the realm of the skies above, and then the realm of the seas and the land below, right? So, the, so this pattern echoes the very pattern of creation itself. If you remember the first sentence of the book of Genesis, in the beginning, God created the, and the, right? The skies and the land. What's up there and what's down here? It's a way of kind of bracketing it all together and saying everything, everything, right? And Psalm 148 is particularly interesting in the way that it unfolds this. It, it calls first for the very space of the sky itself to praise God. And then it calls for the inhabitants of the heavens and the skies to praise God. And it, it describes two kinds of messengers. There's these spirit messengers, we call them angels, these divine beings also created by God that do his bidding. But it also says the sun, moon, stars, all you heavenly bodies praise God. Now, it's important that we consider what this means because to the ancient Near Eastern people, when they hear about stars and planets and the sun and the moon, they, don't, they weren't thinking of flaming orbs of gas floating in empty space. They were not thinking of this big ball of rock orbiting the, the planet every month. Right? That's the way we see them. What they understood these to be were actually divine beings. We would call them angels, right? But divine beings who took on the form of these objects in the sky who were moving along pathways set by God, the creator, for the purpose of governing and ordering the times and the seasons of the earth. Now, if you wonder where I got that from, just look at Genesis chapter 1, verses 14 through 19. It's right there. So, these inhabitants of the heavenly realm are called to give praise, and the psalmist gives three reasons. He says, first, <laughs> because his command is what called them into existence. Second, because he made them to last forever. As long as creation lasts, they will last. And third, because nothing can shift them from their appointed path. You may not want the sun to come up at the time in the morning that it does, but it's going to come up whether you want it to or not. There's not much you can do about it, except pull the shade, right? But here's what's fascinating about this. God's creation declares his greatness and goodness simply by doing exactly what he created it to do. Isn't that fascinating? And then the call to praise turns to the second realm, everything below the skies, the seas and land, and the creatures that inhabit them. You can see it just unfolding. In a, in a progression down through the, the poem. First, he calls even to the chaos monsters of the sea. Now I had to cut some stuff out here because I wanted to talk about what the chaos monsters are, but we're not gonna talk about that. Ask me if that raises your curiosity. But also he talks about the deep fire from below and the hail and the snow and the clouds and the wind of the storm that he says, do his bidding. That's something to chew on, isn't it? For in creation, God did not, it seems that he did not eliminate darkness. He did not eliminate chaos. But what he did is he separated darkness from light. He separated the seas from land and all those monsters and strange, he contained them over there so that by his mercy, they might not harm us. And so this is why I've had several uh, 
teachers who have been teaching me through the books that I read and, and things like that, who have pointed out, for instance, that the flood that we read about in Genesis chapter six was just God withdrawing temporarily his protection from the earth. It was an act of decreation where chaos was no longer separated out, but was allowed to take over the world for a while. Right? And then he talks about the trees and the birds of the air and the beasts of the field, how they bring praise to God simply by fulfilling the purpose, their purpose God created for them and going about the business God gave them to do. And then he talks about all people, the powerful and the powerless, the old and the young, everyone everywhere is called to give praise to God. Why? For three reasons. Because no one can match God's reputation. His name stands above every other name. Second, no one can match his splendor. There's no one who is more beautiful or glorious than the God who made the world. And third, he has raised up for his people a horn. Doesn't that phrase fire you up? No, if you're like me, you go, raise up his people a horn. What? <laughs> so I want to talk about that with you just for a little bit. Because that actually, that's the climax of the whole poem. That's where everything kind of comes together and explodes. Now, it's a peculiar phrase to us, but it appears many, many times throughout scripture. And the, the word that's used here and the way that it's used here evokes an image of a bull raising its horns in victory after a battle, right? And, and, and I just read a, a, a novel that I have read several times that I love. It's called Lonesome Dove. And there's this, there's this scene in that, in that story where a, a bull that has led a, a, a herd of cattle from Texas going to Montana, somewhere in Colorado, this bull uh, meets up with a grizzly bear and they have a fight. And the bull actually beats the grizzly bear to a standstill. And they each go their own way. And afterwards, it shows this bull. At that point, he only had one horn left. <laughs> Just going, uh, uh, leaving out, a, letting out the kind of bellow that a, that a, that a, only a bull who's just beat a grizzly bear can give out, right? And that's the, that's the image that comes to mind. What kind of enormous power comes with a victory won by a by an animal of that, of that kind of strength? Maybe it's easier for us to relate, especially in in Olympic time. Uh, think of an athlete after a hard fought contest who holds the trophy high over his head as the crowd erupts in thunderous applause. That's, that's, the, that's the feeling involved in raising a horn, right? Raising a horn. And so this trophy, this horn, what, what he's driving at, what the poet, poet is driving at here is this is a sign of victory that belongs to Israel, the people of God, right? So when I say Israel, it's, we can say the people of God, it's a sign of victory that belongs to the people of God, but Israel is not the one who raises the horn. God raises the horn because God is the one who has won the victory and he has given that victory to Israel. So what sort of victory are we talking about? Well, if we look in other places in scripture, it gives us a, a, a help of understanding this. It kind of unfolds the image. We're just going to look at two um, that are representative of the rest. In fact, I'm going to recommend that you go back maybe and read these uh, this week and, and meditate on them. You may remember the story of Hannah from uh, 1 Samuel, the book of 1 Samuel, right? She was a devout woman who loved Yahweh and she prayed that God would deliver her from the shame of childlessness. That was a, a very heavy thing in, in those days in that culture. And when she received news that God had answered her prayer, it says, Hannah prayed aloud and she said, my heart rejoices in the Lord. In the Lord, my horn is lifted high. My mouth boasts over my enemies for I delight in your deliverance. Who were her enemies? The people who were criticizing her and spreading stories about her because she didn't have any children. And she said, now I have a child. The Lord has done this. And she ends the poem. You should read the whole thing. But she ends the poem by saying, he will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Now, we understand that Hannah was speaking. She was singing 
under the power of the Holy Spirit, inspired by God. And so she sings of one who will come to bring not just victory to her in her circumstance, but to all of God's people. And all of God's people will feel a similar kind of victory as has been given to her. Now loop, leap ahead now to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1. And you may recall the story of the priest Zechariah, who was the father of John the Baptist, right? And how he doubted God's messenger, and so his voice was taken away for a time. And when God gave his voice back to him, he sung this song. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited us and accomplished redemption for his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of David, his servant. He goes on to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins, to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death and guide our feet into the path of peace. That's the nature of the victory that is being sung about in Psalm 148. Zechariah even ties this image of the horn being lifted up directly to the Messiah, our Savior, Jesus of Nazareth, the chosen one of God. So Psalm 48 there reaches this climax in proclaiming God's greatest work. Greater than the heavens and their inhabitants, greater than the seas and the land and all the creatures that fill them, greater than the breadth of all humanity is the victory that God has given his people. So why is this important? Why a whole psalm? Why a whole group of psalms just kind of banging this drum, ringing this bell over and over again. It's because as great as, as great as God's power is, as irresistible as his decrees are, as marvelous and infinite his capacity for beauty and goodness, all of those things are nothing compared to his love for his people. That's why that the raising of the horn for his people. That's why this is the climactic moment of the psalm. All of his power is nothing compared to the boundless immensity of his love. Love that he has made real. Love that he has made visible and tangible to us in Christ, on the cross, risen from death, and coming again. This is why the climax of this poem is the hope we have in God's victory for us. For without him, without that hope, this is all there is. Your life is as good as it gets without that And as marvelous as life can be, and it can be, can't it? There are moments of enormous beauty and grace and joy that we all get to experience. As marvelous as this life can be, we also have to admit, don't we, that sometimes it falls short of what we might hope it could be. Is that not true? <laughs> Regret and shame over the past. Confusion and distress in the present. Fear and anxiety for the future. Who among us has not been touched in some way or another, directly or indirectly, by broken marriages, fragmented families, and fractured friendships? Who among us have not struggled and suffered with pain and illness, injury and illness, pain and grief, weakness and infirmity? with promises unkept, ambitions unmet, hopes that are dashed. How can we, limited as we are, change the past? How can we, limited as we are, control or direct the future? So the message of the Bible, the message of the Psalms, the message of Psalm 148 is not, don't worry, be happy, ignore all of that, and just, you know, that's not the message. God's message is this, all 
that is broken and dislocated in the universe. Broken people, broken things, from the greatest animal to the smallest atom. All of it gets properly fixed and fit together in vibrant harmony and perfect balance only because of the selfless death of our Lord Jesus and his blood poured down from the cross. And because of the irresistible force of God's life by which he was raised again on the third day. You see, I, I had you read the, the account of Jesus' resurrection today because the raising of Jesus is the raising of the horn of victory. You see it? And by his victory, he made us his people. Those of us who were not his people. He welcomed us into his forever family and makes us his new creation, not someday in the future, but the promise is that we are his new creation right this very minute. You may not feel like much of a new creation, but God is telling us this is the fact and how it is. And this hope that we have now and in eternity, it gives us a new reality by which we can live our lives now. A life of praise doing that for which God has made us. Now, here's where, here's where I'm going to challenge you a little bit. And I would invite you to open your hearts and minds to hear, to hear this. If that thought, if, if my going on and on about the goodness and greatness of God and what he's done for us in Jesus, as I just have, if that thought does not stir something deep within you, so that you want even just a little bit, in spite of all your New Englandness and, and conservativeness and whatever else you know, is going on, that you might not want to just say, ooh, <laughs> ooh, even just a little bit, maybe just wheel your toes or something. I got to tell you, if that's not, if nothing I have said today has stirred your heart at all, I, I'm, what's going on? Why not? This is the question we have to ask ourselves. When our hearts are aligned with his, we speak of Jesus to other people out of the simple overflow of our love for him. It's not complicated and it's not fancy. We're just excited about who he is and what he has done for us and how great he is. And it's, it's in fact hard for us to keep quiet when the opportunity arises. So what I'm asking, I mean, it may seem a little harsh. I know many of you have been churchgoers for a long, long time, but it's worth, it's worth reflecting on this. It needs to be said, we don't hesitate to tell people about some great ice cream place we've discovered. I mean, you don't go around all the time buttonholing people on the street saying, have you heard about the ice cream place? Have you heard about the ice cream? But if ice cream comes up in conversation, you're happy to tell them about this great place you found. Am I wrong? I know, come on, I know there are some stone cold ice cream freaks out there. Yeah, thank you. I, it, it doesn't feel weird to tell someone the story of a great deal we found on Craigslist or some, you know, something that's on sale that you went up and bought 20 of at Market Basket because it's in the flyer and maybe they didn't see it. You don't feel weird about that. Maybe you do, I don't know, I would. But people don't, it, it's my point. If you don't have any desire to talk about Jesus to other people, to, maybe it's worth asking why, why you're in this game, right? When the sun, moon, and the stars, and the trees, and the beasts of the field praise God just by doing what they are made to do, how can those who are truly God's people not proclaim what he has made us for? And so I know, I know that a lot of you people, I can see you, I can hear you, you know, I don't hear a lot of, amen, brother, I, but I hear a, mm, a little, you know, a little, mm, here, and, a, and I see a little twitch there, and people go, oh yeah, right, I get that. So there are a lot of you that this does fire you up, and I'm grateful for that, right? And I would, I would invite you to take that a little further, you can do more than just go, mm. you can do better than that, Right? We got a whole book, it's called the Bible, that has all kinds of words that we can use. You can copy them. You can just take them right out of the book and share them with other people. And you don't even have to memorize them. You can just say, hey, look what it says here. <laughs> you don't have to make it up. He already did the work for you, right? 
This call to praise that's been repeated again and again and again in these last five psalms. And not just in these last five, it's, it's kind of throughout the whole, the whole scroll, isn't it? It's a call to witness who God is and what God has done. When I say witness, I mean testify. Right? Testify. And the greatest thing that God has ever done, greater than providing food and shelter for you and me, which he has done, and is wonderful. I'm so grateful for good food and a, and a, and a, and a warm place to stay in the winter and right, all kinds of good things. More than all of that providential care is that he sent Jesus to rescue you and me because we needed it. And if you can't or won't speak of that when the occasion arises, what, what does that mean? And I'm not accusing anyone of this or that. It's just a question that we have to ask. Right, so let me give you some suggestions. You can call it homework if you want. I don't know. Maybe that'll turn you off. Three suggestions, two suggestions going forward. First, I would ask you to just think now and maybe even write it down if you have a pen and paper handy. I see some of you do. Who might you, who, who needs to hear this, what you've heard today or something like it? Who in your life needs to hear about this? How good God is and what he's done for us. Who needs to hear about that? And will you pray that God will give you the opportunity to open your mouth and share with them. It doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to be a lecture. You don't have to pin them down and hold the four spiritual laws up to their face. You can even just say, yeah, Jesus did that for me. So something like that. So they know, you know, that you actually put your faith in someone outside of yourself, outside of things of this world. That's the two suggestions. I kind of rolled them together. Ask yourself who needs to hear it and then commit to share with them. And second, especially if you can't think of anyone, pray that God will reveal someone to you. And that will God then, and that the opportunity will be there. Maybe you have someone particularly in mind, but you don't know how to broach the subject. Pray that they will do it, that they will ask a question, right? And by the way, you can simply ask a question. Hey, have you ever thought about this? What do you, what do you think about Jesus? What do you think about God? What, what's your opinion on this? And you can just listen to what they say. And that will be a beautiful thing because it will tell you a lot about maybe what is it about Jesus that you can share with them. Man, this call to, to praise God, it's, 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 it's not a suggestion. It's not a guideline. Hallelujah. Remember? It's in the second person. It's, hey, you, you out there, yeah, you. I mean you. Praise God. Praise God. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, let us all praise God. Thank you.